Welcome to the Pre-Adamite World session. This is part four, the final class. Let's go to Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2. This is our foundational text. It says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. So we have learned up to this point that God originally created the earth as dry land, that there was a civilization on the earth before Adam and Eve, that Lucifer actually ruled the civilization, and he got that civilization and one-third of all the angels to rebel against God. So as a result of that, God then destroys the whole earth with a flood. So let's go over to Psalm 104 and let's look at some new things. We're going to go through a lot of information again. I There's a couple surprises that if I have time, I'll get to at the end. Psalm 104 verses 1 and 2 and 5 through 7. Psalm 104 verses 1 and 2 and 5 through 7. It says, bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty, who cover yourself with light as with a garment, who stretched out the heavens like a curtain. You who laid the foundations of the earth so that it should not be moved forever. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled. At the voice of your thunder they hastened away. So what we see here is the result of Lucifer's flood. So we are mentioning that there were two floods on the earth, Lucifer's flood, which we see in Genesis 1-2, and then Noah's flood. So when God tells Noah, I'm never going to flood the earth again, it's not because it was the first time, but the second time that he did it. So let's look at these scriptures. The Bible says that you laid the foundations of the earth so that it should not be moved. So God created the earth to be eternal and to be inhabited eternally. But it then says that you covered it with the deep as with a garment. So when the Bible says, when God is saying that he covered it, that means it wasn't originally created that way. He flooded it. It wasn't created in water. The earth was created dry and then flooded. Let's look at a couple of these words. The word cover means to conceal, to hide, to cover sin. To conceal, to hide, to cover sin. So when he floods the earth, when he covers the earth with water, he is covering up the sin that was created on the earth from the pre-Adamites and one-third of the angels. He says you covered it with the deep as with a garment. Now that word garment is interesting. It means an abyss of a surging mass of water. An abyss of a surging mass of water. So this is an act of judgment. God is judging the earth. Now people say, well, couldn't this be talking about Noah's flood? No. Why? Because it refers to that you uh, laid this down from the foundations of the earth. We're talking about the foundation of the earth, which again goes back to Genesis 1.1. Noah's flood was a result of rain, not a surging mass of water. The way that Noah's flood took place is er water actually came from the ground of the earth and it rained from the sky. This is talking about basically a dump, a massive surge of water that comes upon the earth. In verse 7, it says, At your rebuke, they fled. They what? The waters fled. At the voice of your thunder, they hastened away. So the Bible is talking about a rebuke here. That word rebuke means to chide or reprove to chide or reprove. That is a result of judgment for sin. You rebuke your children. Uh, you are scolding them. 
Then the Bible says, at your rebuke, they fled. The word fled there, uh, the Hebrew root word, means to vanish or escape. So basically, he rebukes the waters, and they vanish, they escape. It says, at the voice of your thunder, they hastened away. The word hasten means to start up suddenly. So what is happening here is we see a flooded earth and God speaks a word and all that water suddenly disappears. It's an instantaneous occurrence. No such rebuke was given after Noah's flood. If we go over to Genesis 8, 1 through 3, Genesis 8, 1 through 3, it says, Then God remembered Noah. Now remember, Noah's been in this ark for a while. And every living thing and all the animals that were with them in the ark, God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. It says the fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. Notice it's raining. It's not just a surge of water. And it says, and the waters receded continually from the earth, At the end of 150 days, the waters decreased. So in Noah's situation, the waters naturally recede over 150 years. In the case of Genesis, really it's going to be the redemptive work that takes place the day two and three in Genesis. These waters instantly disappear. So let's go over to Genesis 1. 6 and 9, and let's look at this and how it's phrased. Genesis 1, 6 and 9. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Then God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. When God speaks that, it is an instantaneous action. It is not a slow receding action. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. God floods the earth as a result of judgment for the sin of the pre-Adamites. Now, spirits are eternal. They cannot die. Angels were created as spirit beings. Humans, we as humans, we are spirits, but we are confined to this body while here on the earth. So the question that I would propose is why would God flood an earth unless there was a civilization to destroy? Think about that. If it was only Lucifer and the angels on the earth, flooding the earth would not have killed them. It wouldn't have done anything to them because they were spirit beings. So there had to be a civilization that had the ability to physically die. And we are referring to them as the pre-Adamites. Genesis 1-2 from the Farrar Fenton translation says it this way. The earth became unorganized and empty. And darkness covered its convulsed surface while the breath of God rocked the surface of the waters. So what we see is the earth went through a period of convulsions, spasms, eruptions, earthquakes, and a great cataclysm that destroyed all animal and vegetative life on it. Now, most scientists would agree that some catastrophe occurred on the earth that caused it to be turned upside down and inside out. So I want you to think about this scripturally for a minute. If the earth was created as a model of heaven, which it was, and the Bible says that it's the Father's will on earth to be the same as his will in heaven, then let's think about heaven for a minute. Heaven has streets of gold, pearly gates, all kinds of jewels. Well, how does the Bible describe the future New Jerusalem? Well, let's go to Revelation 21, 18 through 21. 
Revelation 21, 18 through 21. This is referring to the New Jerusalem, which is after the 1,000-year millennial reign. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. New Jerusalem is going to come down. And the Bible describes it this way. The construction of its wall was of jasper. And the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundation of the wall of the city was adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper. The second, sapphire. The third, chalcedony. The fourth, emerald. The fifth, sardonyx. The sixth, sardius. The seventh, chrysolite. The eighth, beryl. The ninth, topaz. The tenth, chrysoprase. The eleventh, jacinth. And the twelfth, amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like a transparent glass. So what we see is a city constructed of precious jewels. Then I want you to think back to Ezekiel 28, 13, where we read that Lucifer was ruling the earth, and he was surrounded by precious jewels. It says, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sarcius, topaz, the diamond, beryl, ox, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. Many of the same gems that we mentioned in Revelation 21. So you're all sitting there saying, okay, what's your point? Well, what does that matter? Well, all these precious stones and jewels were found in abundance on the surface of the earth. Where are the majority of them found now? Beneath the earth. How did they get there? from a catastrophe that caused the world to be turned inside out and upside down. Uh, with that thought in mind, I want to look at another thing that is going to bring us to dinosaurs, which is what people have been waiting for. Let's talk about fossils for a minute. In very basic terms, Fossils are the remains of animals and plants that have been preserved in the rocks of the earth. Fossils are generally formed from something quickly buried after its death. The most common way this occurs is on the bottom of bodies of water. So when an animal or plant dies and its remains are covered up quickly by sediments, it forms fossils. The sediments around the remains harden into rock. So most animals and plants that have become fossilized have either lived in water or were washed into it after they died. I believe that fossils are the result of the flood in Genesis 1-2. That we have this mass of surging water that is dumped upon the earth and fossilizes these animals and plants. Instantly burying them underwater. This did not occur with Noah's flood. Again, that flood took a period of time from rain. In the pre-Adamite flood, the force was so great that all water life was destroyed. Not the case with Noah's flood. Water life was not destroyed under massive pressure. So, could Lucifer's flood result in the extinction of the dinosaurs? I completely believe that that would be the more plausible explanation because it accounts for all the fossils discovered that would have been the result of an instantaneous surge of massive water. It also accounts for the dating methods of dinosaurs existing millions of years ago. And from a biblical perspective, there is no real record from Adam and Eve of dinosaurs roaming the earth and causing chaos. Now, the one verse that people will bring up is what about Job 40, 15 through 18? I know you were all thinking that. 
So let's look at Job 40, 15, and 18. It says, take a look at behemoth, which I made, just as I made you. It eats grass like an ox. See its powerful loins and the muscles of its belly. Its tail is as strong as a cedar. The sinews of its thighs are knit together tightly. Its bones are tubes of bronze. Its limbs are bars of iron. So people, oh, right there. That could be a dinosaur. Okay. First of all, this is the only scripture in the Bible that uses this word. We have to be very cautious when translating scripture that we do not make a doctrine or theology over one word. The word behemoth literally means a large animal, exact identity unknown. In fact, some translations actually refer to it as a hippopotamus. Now, the Bible says here that it eats grass. Well, 35% of dinosaurs were carnivores, so that would rule them out. Now, if dinosaurs roamed this world, wouldn't the Bible have had to address the calamity that they would have caused? It doesn't. It's more feasible that they lived in the pre-Adamite world and were destroyed by a catastrophic flood. Now, could they have possibly existed since Adam and Eve? I'll run down another thought because this is possible. If we look at the size of Noah's ark, could Noah have fit dinosaurs on the ark? When I was in high school, I actually did a research paper on Noah's ark. And if you actually look at it and the size and capacity of it, it is equivalent to 525 railroad cars. So it is feasible or possible that it was large enough to carry dinosaurs. You don't have to take full-grown animals onto the ark. You can take smaller versions of them. Now, bear in mind, uh, another interesting thing to consider is lizards. All right, I had uh, an iguana when I was younger. And when I bought that, it was only six inches. When it got to be four feet, I decided it was getting a little large, and I sold it. Why is that? Lizards continue to grow throughout their lifetime. So if we consider the lifespan of humans before Noah's flood, people lived six to 800 years old. So man basically lived 10 times longer than he does now. Imagine if you took a common lizard and you expanded its lifetime by 10, recognizing that it continually grows, maybe we still have dinosaurs on the earth. They just don't have the full capacity to grow. Based on everything we looked at, the logical conclusion, though, really is that dinosaurs lived in the pre-Adamite world millions of years ago, in the beginning, the dateless past. We really have no idea how old the earth actually is. So if the earth was created perfect and inhabited and later destroyed with a flood, then what exactly is going on during the six days that we often think of as creation. So let's go back to Genesis 1, and let's look at verses 1 through 5, 16, and 19. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So evening and morning were the first day. Then God made two greater lights, the greater light to rule the day, 
the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. So evening and morning were the fourth day. So the question that a lot of people have is, how could there be evening and morning on the first day when the sun wasn't made till the fourth day? There is a scriptural law called the law of double reference, where a scripture can have two separate and distinct meanings. Revelation 21 talks about the new Jerusalem having no need of the sun or moon because the glory of God would be its light. So when God shows up on the scene, he lights up the situation. The second interesting point to consider has to do with one of the hidden meanings of light. In Matthew 6, it talks about your eye being good or bad, being filled with darkness or light. And your eye refers to the way that you see things. In John 11, Jesus talks about people stumbling in the dark because they don't have light. So I used to teach math, and some people hate algebra, and algebra may be confusing to you at first. But all of a sudden, when you see the light, then everything's in order, and it makes sense. So with that in uh, thought, let's go back to Genesis 1-2. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So the Bible says darkness was upon the earth, which means the earth did not have light. What was the result of darkness? Chaos. It says the earth was formless and void, empty and waste, in a chaotic situation. Darkness brings chaos. If you can't see, things get chaotic. Now, here's where it gets very interesting. In the ancient Hebrew, the word evening means chaos and morning means order. So in the ancient Hebrew, the word evening means chaos and morning means order. So when it says darkness was upon the face of the earth, darkness also comes from the root word chaos. Light comes from the root word order. So God creates the heavens and the earth. Satan then falls to the earth and brings chaos. Satan is called the prince of the power of darkness. So he is the prince of chaos and confusion. So let's put this all together. Go to Genesis 1, 3 through 5, and we're going to look at what happens on day 1. Then God said, let there be light. Or we could say, let there be order. And there was order. Because remember, the earth is in a chaotic situation. And God saw the light or the order, and it was good. And God divided the light from darkness, or we could say God divided order from chaos. So God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So evening and morning were the first day, or we could say so chaos and order were the first day. God steps back onto the earth and says, let there be light, let there be order. And he separates order from chaos. So what is happening during what most people look at as six days of creation, well, let's look at the six days of creation. They're not really six days of creation. They are six days of restoration, that God is restoring the earth back to the way that he originally created it. And each day, he is literally restoring more order and reducing the chaos that is on the earth. And he continues to do that until all order has been brought back onto the earth. In any chaotic situation... Before anything can be accomplished, 
you must first bring order back into the situation. So you have two kids fighting. Mom and dad step in. What's the first thing they got to do? They got to get order. They have to maintain order to reduce chaos. And that's what God is doing in Genesis 1. Now, when it talks about evening and morning were the first day, People will argue, are these 24-hour periods where it was each day a 1,000 years? I firmly believe these are 24-hour periods. God is establishing what a day is. He establishes a whole week. It says on the fourth day that the sun and the moon uh, brought morning and evening. Well, why would that day be any different than the first three? So if you actually look at the word day in the Hebrew, it actually defines it as a 24-hour period. And interesting, the same word day is used throughout the whole Old Testament to refer to normal days. It's the same day that's used in Genesis during these six days of restoration. So why would God define it differently in Genesis 1 than any other part of the Bible? All right, let's look at day two. Genesis 1, 6 through 8. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Then God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heavens, so the evening and morning were the second day. That word firmament in the Hebrew means an expanse. It means the vault of heavens, the arch above. Literally, it means an expansion of plates. So again, an expanse. The vault of heavens, the arch above, literally an expansion of plates. So what is God doing here? He's dividing the waters on the earth from a canopy of waters in the heaven that surrounded the earth. So God forms uh, this canopy of water all around the earth. And what it creates is a tropical paradise. So when Adam and Eve come onto the earth, they are living in a tropical paradise. That would have produced a greater amount of oxygen. That is vital to cellular growth and life. We breathe in oxygen. We breathe out carbon dioxide. Plants function the opposite of animals. So in a tropical situation, there would have been more vegetation, meaning more oxygen, which could attribute to why men lived longer back then. And I really believe that after Noah's flood, all of a sudden you see the age of men greatly reduced because now this expanse of water around the earth is gone. More of the sun's rays are hitting the earth, and it reduces the lifespan of man. So during Noah's flood, that canopy of water in the atmosphere falls to the earth. Day three, Genesis 1, 9 through 13. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw it was good. So evening and morning were the third day. God establishes here the law of sowing and reaping. That like would produce like. What does that mean? Dogs produce dogs. Cats produce cats. Humans produce humans. Everything after its kind. 
And all seeds contain within themselves the power to reproduce. So the harvest is in the seed. So God is establishing seed time and harvest as well. Day four, Genesis 1, 14 through 19. Then God said, let the lights or let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. Let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, which we know of as the sun, and the lesser light to rule the night, which is the moon. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw it was good, so evening and morning were the fourth day. So here we have the introduction of the sun, the moon, and the stars. The purpose of the lights is to divide the day from the night. That word signs there, it says, let them be for signs. The word signs means an indication to convey some meaning. An indication to convey some meaning. So darkness is a sign or an indication to us of a civilization that rebelled against God and fell. Sin brings chaos. Day 5, Genesis 1, 20 through 23. Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw it was good and God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let birds multiply on the earth so evening and morning were the fifth day so god makes the water life and the birds all right day six this is where we come come into play here genesis 1 24 through 25 then god said let the earth bring forth living creatures according to its kind cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth each according to its kind and it was so and God made the beasts of the earth according to its kind cattle according to its kind and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind and God saw that it was good so God makes animal life then in verse 26 God said let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, and over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. The Bible says here, and God said. That word God in the Hebrew is Elohim. Elohim. And what it means is God's plural. So what it is referring to is what we call tr the Trinity. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. It is a word that we came up with to describe the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. At that time back then, it wasn't the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It was the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. He doesn't become the Son until he manifests on the earth. We see that in John 1, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Notice it says, let us make man in our image. Plural, not just one, but the Trinity. Now notice what it says, let us make man. It's very important that you see that man was made, not created. What we see is everything taking place during these days of restoration. They're not creations. They are things that are being made. Remember, the word create means to bring something into existence out of materials that didn't exist. That's what he did in Genesis 1.1. But now, as he's restoring everything, he's making it. The word make there means to make out of already existing material to make 
out of already existing material. How was man made? From the ground. Material that already existed. We see that in Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. God does something that he didn't do with the original creation, the pre-Adamites. He makes man in his image and his likeness. That word image means representation or resemblance. Representation or resemblance. The word likeness means personality. So when it says God made us in his image and likeness, that means we were made to look like God and to act like God. Then it says that let them, now notice, them means male and female. I mentioned this before, but it bears mentioning here. On the sixth day, both male and female were created. People have often taught, okay, Adam was created, and then who knows, a couple months go by, uh, he looks lonely, let's make woman. No, they're both created on day six. Let them have dominion. That word dominion means the right and the power to govern and control. The right and the power to govern and control. Only man has that right. That's why Jesus had to be born a man. In order for him to operate with authority on the earth, he had to be born a man. And God fashioned Man so much like himself that Jesus could come down to earth and take on flesh. That's why Satan hates us so much. <laughs> There's a bug trying to get me. Be gone. That's why Satan hates us so much. He was originally placed on the earth to rule over it, but because of his pride, he was cast down and everything that he got to rebel with him was destroyed. God then forms a new earth, makes a race with his looks and personality, and gives them complete control. So the same job that Lucifer used to have, we now have. And to make things worse, we now have dominion over him. So he hates you. Luke 10, 19, Jesus said, Behold, and he's speaking to us, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. James 4, 7 says, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So Lucifer hates God for what God did to him, but he loathes us because we are God's treasured creation. Then look at Genesis 127. Because I don't want you to think that I'm contradicting myself. But look what it says here. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. That word created there is the same word in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But didn't we read in verse 26 that he says man was made? So is the Bible contradicting itself? No. What we need to understand is that our bodies were made from the dust of the earth, but our spirits, like angelic beings, were created, which means to bring into existence out of nothing. Then go to Genesis 1.28. Ready to get a little blown away again? Genesis 1.28. I'm going to read this from the King James Version because you need to see it the way it's actually written. It says, And God blessed them, who? Adam and Eve. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Think for a minute. 
replenish the earth. The word replenish means to fill it again. That indicates that it was once filled, so I want you to fill it again. Now, if that was the only verse that I had, we couldn't create a doctrine out of that, but it just goes along with everything we've been talking about for the last three weeks. Other translations that use replenish, the 21st century King James Version, the American Standard Version, the BRG Bible, the King James Version, the Authorized King James Version, and the Modern English Version. Most translators wouldn't have translated it replenish because it didn't make sense to them. So they went with plenish. Now, some argue that the Hebrew word simply means to fill, but Strong's indicates that the word replenish is part of the definition. So let's look at how the same word is used in a different scripture. If we look at Genesis 9-1, it says, And God blessed Noah and his sons, and he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So Noah and his family, they finally get off the ark. And what's the first thing God says? Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. The very same thing he said to Adam and Eve. Does it make sense to say it to Noah to replenish the earth? That the earth used to be filled and now I want you to fill it again? Yeah, it makes sense in Noah's situation, but we scratch our head with Adam and Eve until we understand the complexity that there used to be a civilization on the earth, and God is telling Adam and Eve, I want you to fill it again, just like he tells Noah when he gets off the ark. You can also look at, just write these down, Isaiah 2.6, Isaiah 23.2, Jeremiah 31.25, Ezekiel 26.2, Ezekiel 27.25, Every single one of those verses indicates a refilling of some sort. So why would it be defined differently in only one of the seven verses that it is used? Even if I said, fill this glass with water, it doesn't mean it was never filled before. So again, it just shows us another light of everything making sense. All right, go over to Genesis 131. And I will show you the last argument that people make for looking at a pre-Adamite world. Genesis 131. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and evening and morning were the sixth day. So there are people who question this verse in conjunction with a pre-Adamite world. And they're questioning as well. It says God saw everything he made and it was good. So the squabble is if there was a whole other creation that sinned and rebelled and if there was a whole other creation that fell and God destroyed the earth, how could God say everything he made was good how could it be considered good? Now, if you're thinking in lines of everything we talked about, you probably already know the answer. Very simply, God is referring to everything he has made or restored during the last six days. He is referring to the new world system, the world that now exists, not the one that perished. Notice, he said everything he made, not created. So actually, this actually proves my point, not the skeptics, because I could turn it around and ask the same thing. If there was no former social system, no former world, and we know that by day six, Lucifer and one-third of the angels rebelled against God and were cast to the earth, how would that be good? That wouldn't be good. So again, that all took place with a different social system. So to discount a pre-Adamite race, 
leaves too many unanswered questions and a refusal to plainly look at the scriptures. What caused the calamity? In Genesis 1-2, Jeremiah 4, Psalm 104, and 2 Peter 3. Why would God create the world in chaos as in Genesis 1-2? When did Lucifer fall if he's already a fallen creature when Adam was created? When did Lucifer have a kingdom on the earth before Adam? Why is hell prepared for the devil and his angels, and why is it located in the earth? How could Adam replenish an earth that hadn't been plenished before? Why would Genesis 1-2 be an act of creation if Noah's flood was an act of judgment? When were the angels created? Why is there jealousy and malice between man and spirit beings if we're all part of the same creation? And how could God create something in darkness if there's no darkness in him? Let me conclude this with one more thought. We are a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. Our spirits live forever and cannot die, but this earth suit, our bodies, will eventually pass away. Your spirit is either going to spend eternity with God or end up in hell. So God set up a system for judging mankind. However, Satan and his subjects have not yet been permanently judged as they continue to raise havoc on the earth. And they will eventually be thrown into the lake of fire. So since Satan wouldn't have been judged yet, neither would the pre-Adamite race. So the pre-Adamite race had bodies and could be physically killed, which is what God did with the flood. That would not have affected Satan and the angels. They were already spirits. So, the spirits of the pre-Adamites would have continued to live on, and I believe those spirits are what we call demons that they are disembodied spirits that once had a body and now they seek to get back into a body to exhibit their personalities. The only way or only a human has authority on the earth. So a spirit can manipulate you to use that authority. Demons are not fallen angels. There is no indication in Scripture that an angel seeks to inhabit a body. Hebrews 13 indicates that angels can take on the appearance of humans. The word angel simply means messenger. Again, no indication of angels entering a person's body. So I would say it this way. If a bad angel could enter a person's body and make them act bad, then why wouldn't a good angel do that? To make you act good. If demons aren't the disembodied spirits of the pre-Adamites, then what are they? It explains the phenomenon of reincarnation also. You talk to people and they say, well, I was reincarnated. You know, back in 1200 and so, I used to be queen of whatever. And they research it out and they find, well, all those details are correct. They must have lived back then. Well, yes, the spirit lived back then in that person. And then goes from one person to the next. The pre-Adamite world teaches us that there are consequences to our actions. The history of Lucifer and his vendetta against mankind and ex explains a lot of scientific timetables. Scientific truth can never contradict biblical truth, but scientific theories do contradict the Bible in numerous ways. I hope you guys got some information that will make you think and make you want to dig into the Bible a little bit more. But I do have a little bit more time if you want. There was two other things I was going to talk about, but I can't talk about both. So 
why don't we end talking about the Nephilim? Because this is another subject that people have grossly perverted from reality. Where do giants come from? So go over to Genesis 128, and we're going to establish a couple things here. Genesis 128, and let me tell you what the common thought is that the Bible talks about Nephilim or giants that roam the earth, and what people believe is that fallen angels had sex with human women, and they produced this hybrid of giants on the earth. That is the common theory, uh, and I'm going to show you biblically how that cannot possibly be correct. Genesis 128. And God blessed them, speaking of Adam and Eve, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So what we need to see from that is all of the possible variations of mankind, eye color, hair color, ear sizes and shapes, skin complexions and colors, size and height were all found in the first man and first woman, Adam and Eve. God programmed variety into just one man and woman. You ever hear of small parents who produce tall children or vice versa? Absolutely. Some people wrongly assume that giants in the Bible could only be produced by some supernatural event, not by natural conception. So the common misconception is that angels had sex with humans and produced hybrid giants. All right, go to Genesis 6, and let's look at where people get this from. Genesis 6, 1 through 8. Now, it came to pass when men, and I'm just going to emphasize some things because I want you to see what the Bible says compared to what people say. When men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, all of whom they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever. For he is indeed flesh, yet his day shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bore children to them. They were mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I am sorry I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What I want you to see when you read this is it focuses on man and his wickedness. It doesn't mention angels at all anywhere in there. In verse 1, when men began to multiply. Verse 3, my spirit shall not strive with man forever. Verse 3, for he is indeed flesh. Verse 4, they were mighty men. Verse 5, the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great. Verse 6, and the Lord was sorry he had made man. Verse 7, the Lord said, I will destroy man. So how do people interject angels into this scenario? Verse 1 again, when men began to multiply and daughters were born to them. The issue comes in verse 2 when it says sons of God came to the daughters of uh, uh, men. So some have taught that that refers to angels. Now, the word angel or angels appears in Genesis 15 times, why not here? Why in all the other verses, it clearly says angels, but in this one, we're going to mask it. We're going to pretend that that doesn't exist. There is a biblical interpretation principle. If the literal sense 
makes common sense, then seek no other sense. So unless otherwise told, most people would never read Genesis 6-2 and interpret it as angels committing immorality with women and producing giants. Most people would never get that. You get that because that's the way you were taught. Immediately after it refers to sons of God saw daughters of men and took wives for themselves, the very next verse says, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. doesn't say anything about angels. It says men. So it seems pretty clear cut. Now in 2 Peter 2.4, 2 Peter 2, 4, it says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them in the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. So it refers here to angels doing something vile and being held in chains of darkness, but it doesn't indicate what they did. Then in Jude 1, 6, it says, and the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of that great day. There it says, did not keep their proper domain. All right, what does that mean? The New Living Translation says, did not stay within the limits of authority that God gave them. The ERV says, who lost their authority to rule. And the Message Bible said, who didn't stick to their post, abandoning it for other darker missions. All right, it could refer to, and probably does, the angels who rebelled with Lucifer. Now, in Matthew 22, 30, it says this, For in the resurrection, speaking of us, they speaking of us, neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels of God in heaven. So it indicates right here that angels do not marry. But in Genesis 6, it says the sons of God took the daughters of men as wives for themselves, so it couldn't be angels, because angels can't marry. If angels do not marry, then we have to conclude that they can't reproduce because God made a very specific connection between marriage and reproduction when he said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. To all the animals, be fruitful, replenish the earth. Mark 12, 24 and 25. Jesus answered and said to them, Are you not therefore mistaken, because you do not know the Scriptures nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they shall neither marry nor be given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. So again, if they're not going to marry, they're not going to reproduce, which means there'd be no need for reproductive organs if you aren't created to reproduce. Then Genesis 6-4. It says there were giants on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, they were mighty men who were men of old, men of renown. Now, here's where people miss it. According to this, there were giants on the earth before the sons of God came into the daughters of men. Because it says there were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men. So if the giants were a result of a sexual relationship between angels and human women then where did the giants who appeared on the earth come from before that supposed angelic connection? Let's look at that word giants. The word giants in the Hebrew is Nephilim. It is only used two times in the Bible. Genesis 6, 4 
and Numbers 13.33. Genesis 6.4 and Numbers 13.33. Uh, Again, be careful about creating doctrine from limited amounts of Scripture. Is it necessary to have angels involved to produce giants? What about Goliath? What about basketball players that we have today? You look at Shaquille O'Neal standing next to someone, he looks like a giant compared to them. The giants mentioned in Numbers 13 were discovered by the spies who entered the promised land. So if, if this crazy, angelic, human hybrid really existed then those giants would have been destroyed in Noah's flood. So how do you end up then with giants in the promised land that are part of some angelic hybrid? Couldn't happen. They would have all been destroyed. Here's the bottom line. Angels and humans cannot biblically reproduce. Angels and humans cannot biblically reproduce because then you are giving Satan the power to create life. And only God can do that. Genesis 1, 11, 21, and 24. We read this before, but I want you to see it scripturally. Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves, which the waters abounded, according to their kind, and winged birds according to its kind. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping things and the beasts of the earth, each according to its kind. God establishes a principle from the beginning in Genesis that like can only produce like. Angels cannot produce humans that would violate God's scripture. So what about the sons of God? In Genesis 6, 2 and 4, it says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful. They took wives for themselves, all of whom they chose. There were giants on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, that they bore children to them. They were mighty men who were of old, men of renown. So, sons of God. Is that angels? It's used five times in the Old Testament. There's five times mentioned in the New Testament. It's Genesis 6 2, 6 4, Job 1 6, 2 1, 38 7, Romans 8 14 and 19, Philippians 2 15, 1 John 3 1 through 2. With the exception of Job, all the other references of sons of God refer to human beings. Are you not sons and daughters of God? In Luke 3.38, it says, The son of Enoch, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Adam is referred to as the son of God. In Galatians 3.26, it says, For you all are sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So sons of God were most likely the descendants of Seth, which is what these verses are referring to. Daughters of men were the godless Canaanites. So there was an unholy alliance between the Sethites and the Canaanites, and they were responsible for the rapid increase of wickedness on the earth. Nephilim does mean giants, but the Hebrew root word is nephal, which means violent or terrorist. So it probably was referring more to character than height. Strong's actually uses the term bully for the Nephilim. 
So these were bullies. The Bible says they were mighty men who were of old. That means strong, mighty, a champion. So it's referring to people who had great physical strength. If I was let next to Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime, he would feel like a massive giant compared to me because of his build. That's why the spies who went in, they said, we were like grasshoppers in their sight. These were strong, mighty champions. It says men of renown. That means reputation, fame, glory. That these people had a reputation because of how they were physically built. It doesn't necessarily mean they were giants like nine feet tall which is the way we've transcribed that. People have incorrectly looked at the term giants and as a result derived incorrect doctrine. All right, we're going to end there. I was going to go through where did Cain get his wife, but that'll have to sit for another time. I appreciate each and every one of you coming. I hope this stirred your mind up and uh, gives you a lot to chew on. God bless you guys.